Good morning again, dear friends. Good to see you this morning. What a wonderful and beautiful day that God has given us to come together on this first day of the week to worship and praise his name. I'm so happy to see all of you here this morning, especially happy that we have visitors or guests in our crowd. If you are visiting with us, we're so happy that you're here today. Please join us now as we study from the Bible in this part of our worship. Please get out your Bibles and make your way over to the Gospel of Luke. Will you go to Luke chapter 18, please? And Luke, the 18th chapter, that's where we're going to read this, this morning. If you are a member of this congregation, I hope that Luke 18 is a place that you're going to be in quite a bit this week. We're going to be reading from Luke, the 18th chapter, and our Bible reading this week. And right now, I want to read some verses that are parallel to the verses that we had in our scripture reading this morning that Brother Scott read for us in Mark chapter 10. In Luke, the 18th chapter, beginning with verse number 18, the Bible says, A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. What do you think? What do you think about this man? What do you think about this man who encounters Jesus on this occasion? What do you think about his attitude? What do you think about his disposition? What do you think about this very interesting conversation that he has with the Lord? I got to tell you this, since the time I was a little boy, this man, this rich man, this rich young ruler that we can read about in three of the four Gospels, he's always stood out to me. He's always been somebody that I have found to be both interesting and intriguing. And so I want you to notice some things that the Bible tells us about this man. First, notice how according to what the Holy Spirit tells us, this man, this man talks with Jesus. This man has a conversation, a personal conversation with Jesus. He actually has a personal conversation with the most important person in human history, God in the flesh, the very Son of God, the Creator, the Sustainer, the, the one who holds the world in the palm of His hands, the Alpha and the Omega, the one that we as Christians have devoted our entire lives to. This man actually has a conversation with Jesus. In fact, if you remember, Mark tells us in his account that he was the one that actually initiated this conversation with Jesus. Mark tells us that as the Lord was making his way to Jerusalem, one final time before he died for the sins of the world, this rich young ruler ran up to Jesus and he knelt before him and he initiated a conversation by asking a very important question. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 17, and here in Luke 18 and verse 18, he asked the question of, good teacher, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Can you think of a better question than that? Can you think of a better question that you could ask Jesus than that? I mean, I hope we can all agree to this question asked by this man on this occasion is the most important question that any person could ever ask Jesus. I mean, this question far exceeds asking the Lord, okay, what exactly was the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden? Or where exactly did Cain get his wife from? Or where exactly, or what exactly happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Those are all trivial questions that have nothing to do with salvation. But this question right here, it has everything to do with salvation. 
This is a question about something that really matters. It is about real life, spiritual life, eternal life. This question is a question of the utmost importance. This is a great question. Asked by this rich young ruler, the only problem is, is he didn't like the answer. He didn't like the answer given to him by the Lord, even though it appears that he has a lot of good things going for him. And he does have a lot of good things going for him. He didn't like hearing. He didn't like hearing that he was lacking. He didn't like hearing that he wasn't as good as he thought he was. He didn't want to accept the fact that while he does have a lot of good things going on for himself, while he's young, and he's rich, and he's religious, and he's even a devoted keeper of the law of Moses, he still has some problems. He still has some serious problems. He still has some serious problems and some serious sins, some serious sins that he was harboring in his life. He was not perfect at all. This man has some problems. In fact, one problem that the Lord exposes on this occasion is the problem of pride. It is the problem of an unwillingness to acknowledge a need of forgiveness from God. You see, instead of falling down before Jesus and begging for his forgiveness, the scripture indicates to us that this man comes to Jesus seeking to justify himself. To justify himself. I think you see that when you look at the information that Matthew gives us in his account. And so we're looking at what Matthew tells us. Because Matthew gives us some interesting information. And in Matthew, the 19th chapter in verse number 16, Matthew says it this way. He says, and someone came to him and said, teacher, what, and watch the language very carefully. Teacher, what good thing Shall I do so that I may obtain eternal life? I really like how Matthew gives us this information. I really like how Matthew words this question here because I think it gives us great insight into the attitude that this man has when he approaches Jesus. Notice how when it came to obtaining eternal life, this man asks a question to Jesus that is really all about himself. It is really about his righteousness. It is really about his goodness and his good works. And don't misunderstand. Don't misunderstand. We are not suggesting right now that good works are not important. We're not suggesting that righteousness and a need to obey God and his will is not important. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does, he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven will enter. Jesus says good works are important. Jesus says that righteousness and doing the will of God, that is absolutely necessary if we're going to heaven. We are not suggesting right now that righteousness and good works and obedience are not important, but we are suggesting that with this question, this man appears to think that doing good works, doing those kinds of things will earn him a place in heaven. He appears to think that his going to heaven is solely going to be based on what he does apart from the grace and mercy and love of God. He never mentions any of that in his conversation with Jesus. And I think we're going to see this further when we look at Matthew's account more in the context. And so go to Matthew, the 19th chapter. I want to keep reading there in the text. I want to ask you to do something for me this morning. I want to ask you to try to read this story with fresh eyes, if you don't mind. I think this story is a little bit more complicated than we give it credit for. There's a lot going on here beyond the surface. There's a reason why Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this incident here. There's a lot going on here and so we want to really try to look at it very carefully. In Matthew, the 19th chapter, in verse number 16, in verse 16, it says, And someone came to him and said, Teacher, 
What good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. Now there Jesus is, is trying to get this man to understand that by calling him good, he's acknowledging his deity. He's acknowledging that he understands that he's God. He is God there in the flesh. That man is right in suggesting that. Why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you should not commit murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. The young man. Now, this is the only time here. Matthew's the only one that tells us that this was a young man. He's the only one that does that. And it says the young man said to him, all these things I've kept. What am I still lacking? I want you to really picture that scene in your mind. Can you see it? Can you see that? Can you see their conversation? Can you hear their conversation? You know, at this point in their conversation, I can only imagine how good this rich young ruler feels about himself. I can only imagine how proud he must feel about his lifestyle. I mean, Jesus has just given a bunch of commandments found in the law of Moses, and he says he has done that. He has kept the commandments of God. He hasn't murdered. He hasn't committed adultery. He hasn't stolen other people's goods. He hasn't bore false witness. He has spent his life honoring his parents. He loves his neighbor as himself. This man has obeyed the commandments of God. He has done exactly what the law said he must do. In fact, he says, I've done that since the time I was a little boy. And notice how Jesus doesn't say, oh, you're lying about that. Jesus doesn't say he's lying. Jesus doesn't argue with him about that. This man has obeyed the commandments of God. And I'm pretty sure that after he goes through this checklist with Jesus here, oh, he's feeling good about himself. He probably has his chest out. He probably feels like he's a pretty good person and a pretty good Jew. And yet in the next verse of this text, we learn that even though he had done a lot of good things in his life, even though he had obeyed many of God's commandments, he still wasn't better than anybody else on the planet. He still wasn't perfect. He still wasn't sinless. He still wasn't someone who deserved to go to heaven despite all of the commandments that he said he had kept. Jesus is going to tell him, you still have a problem. His problem at this point is pride. It is arrogance. It is a failure to understand that no matter how much good he may have done in his life, he couldn't earn his way into heaven. He couldn't work his way into heaven. He still couldn't get into heaven without humbling himself and seeking forgiveness from Jesus. This is probably the main thing that is, that is often overlooked in this story. So often while commending this young man for obeying the commandments of God, we miss, we miss his wrong view of salvation. We miss the language found in Matthew's gospel. We miss the fact that when he comes to Jesus, when he comes to God, he doesn't approach God like that tax collector does in Luke chapter 18. He doesn't approach God by saying, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. He doesn't approach God like Peter did in Luke chapter five when Peter said, Lord, I am not worthy of you because I am a sinner. He doesn't have what we've talked about in our Sermon on the Mount class. He doesn't have a an attitude of being poor in spirit. He doesn't have spiritual poverty when he comes before Jesus. He doesn't approach God like that. Instead, he approaches God talking about things I can do. He wants to talk about the good things he can do. He wants to rehearse all the commandments he's kept from the time he has been young. He is seeking justification for the way he's lived his life. He wants Jesus to get him a pat on the back and send him on his way. That, my dear friends, is why he is shocked and disappointed when the Lord reveals that he's lacking. 
This man has a pride problem and an arrogance problem. And I submit we need to be careful being like him. We need to be careful of how we view ourselves. We need to be careful of putting our trust in ourselves and in our good works when it comes to our salvation. We need to understand that while we need to obey God and while we need to keep his commandments to the best of our ability, while we need to faithfully assemble with, with the saints on Sunday, while we need to pray, while we need to read our Bibles, while we need to take the Lord's Supper and sing these songs and give sacrificially to God, while we need to evangelize and share our faith and help the poor and serve our brethren, while we need to do all those things, we also need to understand that doing that stuff is not going to earn us a place in heaven. It's not going to earn us eternal life. No matter how much good we do, we still don't deserve to be with the Father in his house. This is why the Apostle Paul told us in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8, for by grace you've been saved, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. This is why Jesus told us in the most famous verse in the Bible, you know it, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, that's grace there, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is why Jesus says this to his apostles going back to Mark's account. Will you go to Mark chapter 10? Because I want to show you something in Mark's account. In Mark the 10th chapter and in verse 23, after this man goes away sad because he doesn't like what Jesus is telling him to do. We'll talk more about that in a second. But in Mark chapter 10 and verse 23, and Jesus looking around said to his disciples how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. Why were they amazed? Well, we talked about that on Wednesday, didn't we? Remember at this time in, Jewish, in the Jewish mind, among the Jewish people, their thinking was, if you had great wealth from God, if you had a lot of money, that was a sign that God favored you. That was a sign that you were right with God, that you especially had a relationship with God and you were on a path to be saved. That is how the Jews thought in that time. But that is why they were amazed that Jesus is saying that this guy, this guy's not going to be saved. Are you kidding me? It's going to be hard for him to be saved. <coughs> but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished. Notice, this guy's not going to be saved. Are you kidding me? And they said, then who can be saved? <laughs> if he can't be saved, none of us are going to be saved. Looking at him, Jesus said, with people, it's impossible. But not with God. For all things are possible with God. What's the message that Jesus is saying to us there? Where there Jesus is saying that if this rich young ruler is going to be saved, if they were going to be saved, if we are going to be saved, then we need God. We can't be saved apart from God. We need his grace. We need his forgiveness. We need his love. We need his compassion. We need his kindness on ourselves, by ourselves. It is impossible for us to be saved. But with God, even terrible people like us, we can be saved. It is possible with God. That's what Jesus wanted these apostles to get. And this man failed to get that. He's seeking to be saved on his own. He's coming to Jesus seeking to be justified and just get a pat on his back and move on. That was one problem he had, but it's not the only problem. Another problem he had is he was unwilling to give Jesus the main thing that the Lord desires from every person, and that is his heart. That is his heart. Again, on the surface, it, appear, on the surface, it appears like this is a pretty good guy, right? I mean, look at all the good things that are said about him. Let's not overlook that. He, run, he runs out to meet Jesus. That, that, that's the right thing to do. He humbles himself. 
He kneels down before Jesus. He acknowledges him as deity by calling him good. He also asks Jesus a spiritual question, and he acknowledges that he has kept the commandments of God from the time he was little, and Jesus never says, no, no, you didn't do that. In many ways, this guy seems like he's got it all together. Seems like a pretty good guy, got a lot going for himself. We would want this kind of guy to be a member of this church. Got a lot of positive things, and yet, despite all of that, there still was a problem with him. There's still a barrier there between him and his God. And so we go back to Mark's account again, and we look at verse number 21. After he tells Jesus, I've kept the commandments from the time I was a small boy. In verse number 21, and, and look at this language carefully here, because Mark is the only one that gives us this. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. Dave mentioned in his Lord's Supper remarks, the love of Jesus, the love of Jesus. This is one of the few times in the gospel, Gospels where the writers tell us that Jesus personally loves somebody. This is one of the few times right here. And it says Jesus felt a love for him. And he said to him, one thing you lack, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But at these words, at these words from Jesus, that there's one thing you lack. He was saddened and he went away grieving. Before he was one who owned much property. How tragic. How tragic. How sad. How sad that while this man was religious and he knew God's word, and he had obeyed God in many respects, when he came face to face with God, he was not willing to give God the main thing that he wants from every single person, and that is his heart. That is his whole heart. He wasn't willing to give God his whole heart. Now, he was willing to give God the external things that he required, but he wasn't willing to give God the internal things he required. We know that because when the Lord told him to do something that he didn't want to do, to give up something that he really loved, well, he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to give up all of his possessions for the Lord. He actually loved his stuff more than he loved the Lord. That was his problem. He didn't want to give up his stuff for his Lord. And the question that often comes up today, maybe you've heard this question, is does the Lord require this of us? Do we have to do this? Do we need to get our houses on the market right now and sell our homes, sell our cars, give up our jewelry, empty our bank accounts? Do we have to go and give up everything we have, sell it all, get the money, and give it to the poor? Is that what the Lord requires of me and you today? The answer to that is no. No, the Lord is not telling you to go and sell everything you have and give to the poor, just like he didn't tell you to go build an ark. And just like he didn't tell you to pick up your family and travel to the land of Canaan. He's not telling you to do this. He's not telling me to do this. He's not telling Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos. He didn't even tell Zacchaeus to do this in Luke 19. And in Luke 19, Zacchaeus is said to be very rich. Jesus never told him, go sell all you have and give it to the poor. Jesus didn't tell Zacchaeus that. Jesus is telling this man to do this. He is specifically commanding this man to do this because he knows something that you and I don't know. He knows hearts. He knew this man's heart. He knew that this man loved his money too much. He knew that he loved his stuff more than he loved the Lord. He knew that this man valued money more than he valued eternal life. Jesus knew this about this man. And that's something we need to think about this morning. We need to think about that. While the Lord does not 
commanding any of us to go and sell all our stuff and give to the poor, we still need to ask ourselves this morning, where is my heart? Where is my heart? Is my heart, all my heart, right now in my life with Jesus? Does Jesus have all my heart or is there something in the way? Is there something right now serving as a barrier between me and Jesus? Is there something pulling my heart away from Jesus? We need to ask ourselves that. Is my job, does my job have my heart? What about my money? What about my sports, my kids' sports, fishing, hunting, camping, worldly friends, and immoral relationship? My computer, my iPad, my cell phone, my social media page, alcohol, drugs, an unforgiving heart, hatred, my children, my grandchildren, maybe pursuit of higher education. Is there something right now in my life standing between me and Jesus? If there is, then I need to learn from this guy. I need to learn from him. I need to do what he was unwilling to do. I need to get rid of that junk. I need to wise up this morning and get my priorities in order. I need to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ does not want to be third or second place in my life. Instead, he wants to be first. He wants the preeminent position in my life. And there are several passages that teach us this, right? Isn't that what Jesus is telling us in Matthew 10, 37? That's what he means when he says he who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's what he means when he asks the question in Matthew 16, 26. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? The answer to that should be obvious. Nothing. Nothing's worth our souls. That's what he means in Matthew 6, 33, when he says, seek first, first the kingdom of God, the rule of God and his righteousness. And God will make sure you have everything you need to survive in this life. All these verses are telling us the same thing, brothers and sisters. They are telling us this morning that Jesus wants to be first place. He wants the place of preeminence in our lives, and it shouldn't be hard for us to put him there because of what he did for us 2,000 years ago at Calvary. Because he died for us. He gave his perfect life on a, on a cross for us. It shouldn't be hard. The Lord shouldn't have to beg us to put him where he deserves. And that is first place. This man wasn't willing to put Jesus there. He asked the right question to the right person. But he was unwilling to give the right person the main thing that he wants from every single person. In fact, that brings us to the last point. And I want to share with you in regards to this man, and that is, even though he had a lot of problems in his life that we got to dig to see, he still was no different than us. He still is no different than me and, and, and you. You see, like me and you, as Jesus says, he was lacking. He was lacking. He was lacking even though he was, even though he was religious. He was lacking even though he was a worshiper of God. He was lacking even though he had kept a bunch of commandments of God and he knew his Bible and he showed respect to Jesus. He was lacking even though he seemed to be like a seemed to be a pretty good person. Even though he seemed to have a lot of good things going on in his life, the Lord was able to evaluate his life. And when he did that, he noticed something. He noticed he was lacking. This man was lacking in his life. And let's just be honest. If the Lord was personally here today and he went out in the parking lot with us and we were able to look him in the eye and talk with him near our vehicle, you know what the Lord would say? He would say, I'm glad you were here today to worship. You should be here. But guess what? You're still lacking. The Lord would say we're still lacking. The Lord will say there's still something wrong with us. There's still an area in our lives where we need to grow, 
where we need to do better, where we need to become better for the Lord. The Lord would tell me that. He would tell you that. And if you don't think he would tell you that, well, there's your problem right there. We got to check that attitude. We got to bury that kind of attitude deep in the ground and never resurrect it. We got to understand that it doesn't matter how long we've been Christians. It doesn't matter how long we've been members of the Church of Christ. It doesn't matter how much of the Bible we know and how many scriptures we can quote and how many sermons we preached and Bible class we've taught. The Lord can still find something wrong with us. He can still find flaws in us. In the case of the rich young ruler, he had pride. He had a love of, of stuff. He loved stuff more than he loved God, but our problem might be different. Our problem might be an uncontrolled temper. Our problem might be lust. It might be a lack of zeal when it comes to doing kingdom work. It might be an unforgiving heart. It might be bitterness. It might be jealousy. It might be an attitude where I'm consumed in impressing people more than I am with impressing God. There are a bunch of problems we could have right now in our lives. But the, here's the point. The point is none of us are perfect. None of us are. None of us have this Christianity thing down 100%. None of us could look our Lord in the eye this morning in the park, park lot and say, you know what, I'm all good. I'm, I, I deserve to go to heaven. I deserve that place with God. I don't need to improve any. None of us could say that. Like this man, we're lacking. And that's why, like this man, we need Jesus. We need Jesus. Because we're lacking, we need to humble ourselves before Jesus. We need Jesus to love us. We need him to give us grace and mercy and kindness. We need those things from Jesus. We need to trust him. We need to surrender to him completely. The rich young ruler, he wasn't willing to do that. He wasn't willing to give up his possessions and obey Jesus and, and gain treasures in heaven. He wasn't willing to put his stuff before his Lord. The apostle Peter said, I'm not going to make that mistake. Can I take you to one more place? Just one more place, please. And we're going to get ready to go into our invitation. I, I just got to read to you some John 6. You remember in John 6 how there Jesus taught a sermon, preached a sermon about being the bread of life. Remember that? That's a sermon about the need to consume him, the need to be consumed in him, to feast on him spiritually, to put him first and give him preeminence. That's what that sermon is really about. And when people heard that sermon, in John chapter 6 and in verse 66, in verse 66, the Bible says, as a result of this, as a result of Jesus preaching, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You, you have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Notice how Peter says, I'm not going to make the mistake of the rich young ruler. Peter told Jesus, I'm not turning away from you. We're not going to abandon you because there's no other way to receive eternal life outside of you. Only you, Jesus, can do for us what we can't do for ourselves. The apostles understood their need for Jesus Christ. The question is, do we understand that today? Do we understand what Peter said in Acts 4 and verse 12, when he said there is salvation in no one else besides Jesus? Do we understand what Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6? Where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Do we understand that only Jesus can save our souls, and there's nothing in the world worth handing them over to the devil? You know, while this world, while this world offers us some temporary satisfaction, some satisfaction, some things that may feel good. While the world does offer us that, we need to understand that that stuff is just that. It's only temporary. It's not going to last forever. Where we end up after this, that's going to last forever. 
That's going to be for eternity. That's going to go on and on and on and on. And that's why we got to make sure we do what the apostles did, and that is stick close to Jesus. Put our trust in him. Surrender to him completely. The rich young ruler was not willing to do that. He did a lot of right things in his life. I don't want to, I don't want to undermine that, okay? He did a lot of right things in his life, but in the end, it appears that he was lost because he refused to give himself over to Jesus. His story, at least in my view, is one of the most tragic ones in all the Bible. This is a tragic story. The question is, what about your story? How's your story going to end up? As you evaluate your own life right now, are you at risk of forfeiting your eternal treasures in heaven? If that is your situation right now, then I want to suggest you need to wise up. You need to apply the word of God to your life. You need to learn from this man that we talked about this morning and put Jesus where he belongs in your life. And if that's something you need to do this morning, we're going to sing a song of invitation to help you with that. If you need to obey the gospel, respond to the gospel for the first time by believing in Jesus and repenting of your sins and obeying his commandment to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. Or if you are a Christian who has left him and you need to come back to him, we will help you with that. Or if there's someone here who says, I have some questions. I want to talk about some of this, some of this stuff about Jesus. I want to know more about Jesus. Pull me aside after service. Pull one, of, pull one of our elders aside. We'll be more than happy to talk with you about Jesus. That's what we're all about in this place. And so if we can help anyone spiritually this morning, come to the front right now. Let's stand. Let's sing together.